we'll continue our discussion from last week. We were talking about Markov decision process in artificial neural networks. Um, today, we're going to talk about artificial neural networks again, continue that topic. And hopefully, if you get a chance, we'll talk about the next uh, topic within ANNs, which is convolutional neural networks. All right, those are for images. Uh, but um, today is an important topic in within ANN. It, we will talk about an algorithm called backpropagation. Okay, and that's sort of the heart of uh, the deep learning phenomena which has happened over the last decade, and which is why uh, you know AI has become so much more popular now as compared to perhaps uh, more than a decade ago. So uh, let's do a quick review. Uh, we were talking about Q values. Uh, in the previous lecture, and we spoke about uh, various versions of the Q equation where we also had the discount factor um, implemented. Then we spoke about exploration versus exploitation. And then we started the topic of machine learning, and we said that we will be talking about uh, supervised learning initially. Um, and we talk, spoke about biological neural networks, artificial neural networks, we looked at a single neural, uh, uh, neural network, which was referred to as a perceptron, which was an artificial neural network, not really a network, just a single cell. And then uh, we looked at how it could be used, a single perceptron could be used to classify a single linearly separable problem, right? So, um, and then we said, uh, can a single perceptron be used to separate a non-linearly separable space? And the answer was no, that can't be done. Okay, And for that, we said that uh, you would need to have a more complex uh, network. And then we said you need to have a multi-layer uh, perceptron. Okay, And this is sort of now a network, a proper network in which you have two uh, perceptrons uh, in parallel and a third one, which is in series. Okay, and so um, we said that here is the uh, the forward equations as we refer to them for this particular network, and we said that it's been told to us that if you use these specific weights, all right, these specific weights over here, and these specific bias values, and these specific weights on the second uh, layer, then this is supposed to be able to solve the XOR problem. Okay, so today let's just uh, work it out and see if it in fact actually solves the problem or not. Okay, so we had figured out the forward equations for this specific uh, uh, neural network. And now let's try to see if it actually works. So I'll need your help again to be able to figure out the values. Uh, so let's take a look. Um, X1, so XOR is the four cases where X1, X2 have the four possible value combinations. And now we'll calculate the F1 value, okay? And uh, what should that be for X1 is equal to zero and X2 is equal to zero? That's simply a combination. The equation is, was solved by us last time, simply X1 plus X2. So this is going to be zero. F2 is going to be what? F2 is given by this equation, so that is? minus one, right? Y1 is going to be now the second layer and Y1 is now using the equation simply, it's the max value of zero comma F1, all right? It is applying uh, which um, um, rectification is being used over here, which, um, sorry, which activation function is being used over here. When you say max zero comma F1, is it the, um, the step function which is being used is it the ReLU function or is it simply linear? You remember ReLU function, which we said was what? Uh, I think we had that somewhere before. So this was the set step function and this was the ReLU function, which was the rectified linear unit. And this simply said that this is a phi of f is given by maximum zero comma f, okay? So um, clearly this is the ReLU function, which is being used over here. So um, Y1 is now uh, using a ReLU function over here. It's being applied on the function F1. So what would that be? Since it's negative 
Uh, so it's basically y1 is being applied on f1. Since f1 is zero, so y1 will clearly be zero, okay? What is y2 going to be? Y2 is also being, uh, in Y2, we're also applying the ReLU function over here, which y is going to say I that zero. it is going to be, since it's uh, the, the F2 is, is negative, so it's going to clamp it at zero, okay? So Y2 is also zero. Uh, what is G now? Now G is given by this equation, which is given by the, uh, the weights over here. So it is, y1 minus 2y2, right? Why? Because the weight over here is minus 2. So what should g be equal to? It should be 0, right? Because it's simply y1 minus 2y2, both of them are 0, so g is going to be 0. And now y and z is simply the ReLU function applied now on the g function, okay? So what is z going to be in this case? Clearly, it's going to be 0, okay? So, so far, so good we have when both inputs are zero, we wanted the output to be zero, right? Because we're trying to solve the XOR function. Uh, let's do the next line a little bit faster. So F1 is going to be zero. F2 is going to be, sorry, I'm making mistake over here. That's somewhat deliberate perhaps. What F, what's F1? One, F2 is going to be what? So one minus one is going to be zero. Y one is going to be maximum of zero. So it's going to be one. Y two is going to be zero. G is going to be uh, one, zero minus two Y two. So that's going to be minus two. Sorry, Y two is zero. So that's going to be uh, Y one. So it's going to be one. One, one. one. okay. So now Z is going to be uh, one, good. Uh, this is what we are expecting, it's an XOR function. Let's do the next one, F1 is here is X1 plus X2, one. F2 is X1 plus X2 minus one, so it's again zero. Correct me if I make a mistake, Y1 is a maximum of for F1, so it's going to be one. Y2 is going to be maximum for F2, so it's going to be zero. G is again going to be, uh, it's the same actually, so it's going to be this and that's going to be one again. Is that right? Okay. Uh, so for the last one, now this is the tricky one because we wanted that when both the inputs are one, we want the output to be zero. So now let's see if this works out. So F1 in this case is going to be what? Two. two sir, two, one. And this is going to be one. Y1 is going to be two. two. Y2 is going to be? One. Uh, one, right? And then G is okay. going to be zero. two minus two Y two. Interesting, zero. right? So now it's coming out to be zero. And so Z is now zero. So you saw that how this specific combination just manipulated the numbers and somehow got the results to the desired value, which is zero, one, one, zero. Okay. Why we chose these numbers, you know, these are just given to us just as a demonstration that yes, if you're using, um, if you want to get in to solve the XOR function, it can be solved using a three perceptron network, okay? And using different combinations of weights, biases, and different combinations of the activation function. So the activation function is very important. If you don't have a non-linear activation, which is what these phi's are depicting, then you would not have been able to solve it. If you simply try to use linear combinations, it would not have been able to solve an XOR problem. Okay, so that's an important takeaway from this. So, um, and this is, I think we can just compare it over here. Seems like we've made a mistake somewhere. G is supposed to be two, one, one. So G is supposed to be Y1 minus two, Y2. So Y1, Minus two y two. That's supposed to be zero. I think I've made a mistake over here. Yeah. Sir, zero, to... zero, and the, but the final result is is right. Okay, good. So um, now the question is, how do you get these weights? Right. I just pulled those out of a hat. Right. And how do we get those weights? How do we get those um, those biases? And so there is no magic to it. There is a method, method to this, as they call the method to the madness, all right? And the technique is called backpropagation. 
and this actually revolutionized um, artificial intelligence and deep learning all right even though this particular algorithm was there for quite some time but uh, you know it became uh, it became very popular after it was realized its potential and this was about a decade ago okay and uh, the backpropagation algorithm is fairly straightforward it uses the gradient descent algorithm which you already are familiar with okay now let's take a look at how it works and you have to pay attention to this this is a little complex but it's about as complicated as this course is going to become okay fortunately for you so uh, please do pay attention to this uh, if you look at the gradient descent now we've already seen how the gradient descent works right so it basically said that if you wanted to get an iterative solution and if you had this uh, nice curve right and if you started off somewhere over here and you had an initial value of xn so we had two values over here x and y and what we're trying to do is we're trying to find the optimal value of x which minimizes or maximizes y minimizes y right in this case because we trying this this may be depicting for example a loss okay so we're trying to depict we're trying to minimize your loss okay so if you're doing a business and you want to minimize your loss in the investments you're trying to minimize this equation so how do we do it we need to be able to use this equation which we derived last time which basically said that we'll find an iterative solution because uh, we don't necessarily know this equation is not necessarily a nice uh, closed form equation, right? You can't really differentiate it and set the difference, the, the, the differential to be zero, which you could do in if you had, for example, a, a, a you know a second order polynomial. Okay, you could have simply differentiated it and set it to zero, but we don't have that. We have a complex equation which is not available in a closed form. Okay, so you you don't have all the values and you can't differentiate it very simply. So what you can do is you can take different values. And you can try to find out the new value, and you can take the, you can find the the rate of change by taking the different values, right? So if you can find out what x n is, and you take a slightly different value of x, and then you you find out what the values of y are, then you can naturally find out what the slope of the curve is. Okay, I hope all of you are familiar with this process, in uh, that should have been covered in in calculus. So if we can somehow find out the rate of change of y with respect to x, then you can solve this iteratively. Okay, and we saw this example last time. We started with value of xn is equal to 11. Initially, we assumed that the differential was minus two, and then the differential was minus one and 0.5, and slowly we crept towards the optimal value, which was where the difference, the rate of change was approaching zero. Okay. So this is just the gradient descent. Now let's see how we would use a gradient descent to be able to use uh, it in a backpropagation algorithm. Where what we're really trying to do now is, if you if you go back over here, uh, in the in the in the gradient descent, we're trying to find the optimal value of x uh, for which y is minimized. Okay. Now let's think back over here. If you think about this what would the value of x be and what would the value of y be in this what are we trying to determine over here what are we trying to solve in this equation i had already solved it right but if i said that we we didn't know the answer to this equation what were we trying to solve over here so we try we're given the output okay so we're saying that uh, well the output is is not really given over here let's say the output is given over here we're trying to find, we're trying to solve the XOR problem. Okay. So our label is given, and our label is saying that if the input is zero, zero, then the output should be zero. Why? Because we're trying to solve this problem, the XOR problem. If the input is zero, one, then the, the label, the so called label, should be one, which is what we want. If the input is one, zero, then we want the output also to be one. But when the input is one, one, we want the output to be zero. So these are the, the labels, as we call them. These are the desired values of the output. Okay. Now, do we have all of this? What we do have is a network. So we, we say that, well, we're going to start off with a network and we're going to try to see if we can find some of the unknowns over here. Okay. So we will, we will take a particular network. So we will, we will take three perceptrons. We'll, mix them up 
in some kind of an arbitrary way. So for example, in this case, we're saying that we're going to take this case where there are three perceptrons, you have the output over here. In this case, the output, sorry, is Z. We're going to combine these with the input X1 and X2 in this particular form. And this is also sort of given to us, okay? This is our guess. And what we're going to try to see is with this network, can we solve the XOR problem, okay? Now, what? so the network is given, the inputs are given, the label is given. Now, what is unknown? The biases are unknown and the weights are unknown, right? So we don't know what these weights are. We can call them W11, W12, uh, W21 and W22. And we can call this W1 over here and we can call this W2. And we, call, we can call this F1 and we can call this F2. And we can use some kind of a nonlinear activation. All right. Now, so far I've spoken about two nonlinear activations. Uh, these were referred to as the ReLU and, and the step function. Okay. Now, if you look at these step functions, there's a bit of a problem in both of these. Um, Remember we said that we will try to take derivatives at some point, okay? So we need to be able to, in order to be able to solve the gradient descent algorithm, uh, what do we need to do? We need to take derivatives, right? At some point we're going to take to need to take derivatives. Now, do you think these two uh, nonlinear activations can be easily differentiated? What's the, what's the differential of this of the step function? Can somebody tell me? Uh, phi prime of F. In other words, d phi by df. Uh, when it's zero over here, what will it be? Come on. Yeah. It's going to be zero, right? You haven't forgotten your calculus completely, have you? When it's going to be a flat over here, what is it going to be? Zero again. When it changes abruptly, what is the differential over here? It's going to be plus infinity, right? Positive because all of a sudden it's made an abrupt change. It's gone from zero to one in a span of, you know, zero, right? So F didn't change. And so all of a sudden the DF was zero and this, so this became, becomes positive infinity. So it is not differentiable, all right? Uh, it, has, it's, it doesn't look nice in terms of differentiating. Um, sorry, let me put this on silence. What about this one? Uh, if you try to differentiate this, uh, oh, clearly it's going to be zero over here. What is it going to be over here? What's the slope of this? It's going to be some constant value. So let's say it could be plus one, all right? Uh, what's the differential over here? Yeah, so it's again a funny, some funny business that we can think about in calculus and mathematicians can figure it out, right? But it's, it's not really well-defined because it's all of a sudden in zero, with zero change in F, there is a perceptible change in the slope, okay? So it's going from some value from zero to here. So again, it's not really defined over here. So so these, uh, these uh, activation functions uh, even though they, they're non-linear, they, they don't have very nice properties because they differentiate, their slope is not very well defined in the entire X space, okay? So instead of these, we're going to use a slightly different uh, function and it's going to have a nice property that it will look something like this, okay? And if you, uh, and I'll show what this is to you. Uh, this is called a sigmoid, okay? So um, let me move this somewhere else. Okay. So we're going to use a sigmoid function for our nonlinear activation. And it's got a complicated looking equation. But whenever you want to plot an equation, if I say plot this, right, or sketch this, how would you sketch this? Yeah, you look at boundary values, right? So it's always good. And you want to sketch an equation. This is true for any equation. Look about, look at what happens in extreme cases, okay? So what extreme cases can you check over here? 
what happens when x is going to infinity what is the value of sigma x okay so this is sigma x when uh, x is going to plus infinity this is how we'll write this equation what is the value going to be so one upon e to power minus it's a it's going to be minus infinity so it's going to become e to the power minus infinity is going to be zero so this is going to go to one upon one which is one right so far so good so you can see that as x goes to plus infinity this sigmoid function goes to a value of plus one right what about when x goes to minus infinity when x goes to minus infinity what is this approach zero why is that because e to the power minus x in the denominator becomes infinite and so one upon infinity becomes zero okay so this becomes zero so you can see that it has this nice value uh, what about when sigma x when x is equal to zero e to the power minus zero is what one so one upon one plus one is half so it has this nice value that is exactly equal to 0.5 over here okay so sort of you can tell that this will have a, this will look like something like this okay if i roughly draw it now it also has a nice property if you spend some time and try to differentiate it that it's uh, you can see that its slope is gradually changing right so its slope is always well defined and if you look at this equation over here which i've shown as a as a dashed line this actually represents this slope of this okay and if you do do this i'm not going to derive this but if you anybody has time or interest you can derive it yourself and it can be shown to be equal to sigma itself multiplied by one minus sigma itself okay and so if you if you if you plot it this is what it comes out to be okay as uh, again as x goes to infinity you can see that this goes to zero as x goes to minus infinity again it goes to zero when x is equal to zero it is equal to 0.5 multiplied by 0.5 which is 0.25 okay so it comes out over here so this is an important function because it will come up over and over again as if you go further in in deep learning at some point you'll come across this, the sigmoid function quite often it's also called a logistic equation which is also useful where if you're doing classification okay so uh, why did i spend so much time on this function because um because of two reasons number one its differentiation is available okay and this will come in handy and secondly it's also useful because uh, it's going to be used quite often in uh, ai and in machine learning okay so having said that now let's go back over here so what were we trying to solve over here we said that we were basically trying to solve the um, the all of these values the wij's values right the the weights and we also wanted to find out what these um these biases were in this case there are how many biases there's a total of three biases okay and how many weights are there total of six right so these four weights over here and these two weights over here okay so we're trying to solve for four weights um and so a total of essentially eight unknowns sorry nine unknowns okay so uh it seems like a tough problem nine unknowns normally you need to have nine equations if you're trying to solve not for nine unknowns right but how many equations do we seem to have over here even at best if you think about all of these as individual equations you can you seem to only have four equations right because you have an xor problem and you have four unknowns sorry for you have nine unknowns and you have four equations okay so it doesn't seem like you can actually solve it in a traditional way okay so now what we're going to try to do is use the back propagation algorithm so basically now the question is that if we're trying to solve this and now the hint here is that we're trying to use the gradient descent algorithm to be able to solve for these nine unknowns so um how could you use the gradient descent to be able to find these values now remember what does the gradient descent do it tries to minimize if you look at the gradient descent it's trying to minimize a certain value y with respect to x and it takes the rate of change of y with respect to x to be able to solve for it right so now the question is uh 
what should we try to minimize? If you use a gradient descent, we so that's the hint. We try to use a gradient descent. Now, if you're trying to use a gradient descent, we're going to either try to minimize some value or we're going to try to maximize some value. It will work in both cases, right? In one case, it uses a negative uh, equation. The other case is going to use a positive. Remember, we, we did that. So uh, we can maximize or minimize some value. Now, the question is, what would you want to maximize or minimize over here? So this is the thinking part. We're given a particular output. So we're given the labels. We're given the X values, the inputs. And uh, this, when we choose a random value of the weights, let's say we start off with the random value of the weights and the biases, okay? Just completely random uh, out of the box. Now it will clearly generate some value of each one of these values. It will generate some F1, F2, Y2, Y1, Y2, G, and some value of Z, right? So what should we try to maximize or minimize if you're trying to solve this problem? Yes. Very good. So do you follow that? We trying to we would try to minimize the difference between the what the desired value is, z hat, what we're saying, and the actual output that we get for those random values. Okay. And if you look at the, we can call that the error. Okay, so the error would be, let's say, z hat minus z for a specific set of w's and, and uh, biases, and you try to minimize this. Okay, now, uh, if you studied, uh, you know, some other courses, you normally try to, for example, if, you, if you're trying to use linear regression, right, you have a bunch of points, okay, and you're trying to draw a straight line. So you must have seen that we try to minimize the error between these two. Okay, so in order to be able to find the uh, the best lines through those random points. Okay, so this is an ex a similar. This sort of similar to that. Now, in that, do we use the absolute error or do we use some function of the error? That's what. Have you ever come across this? You know, trying to do linear regression in which you have, let's say, x and y given. You've got a set of points, and you're trying to find the a linear equation through those points. Have you done that before? You've done that, right? Somewhere in calculus. So did you use the absolute uh, value of the error? We, okay, so what formula did you, do you remember that you used for the error? Now the problem with the absolute value is that in some cases, for example, if I, if I try to draw it out over here, you could have, let's say you're trying to draw a straight line through these four points, right? Now, if the errors over here, in some cases, the error are going to be positive. In some cases, the error is going to be negative. Okay. So generally, and the error you, you want, the error is clearly there. If you, if you look at this, the error is not zero. If you look at this, let's say the error over here is plus two, the error here is minus two, the error here is plus three, the area, error here is minus three, right? Now, if you sum up the actual values of the error, what will the overall error come out to be? It'll come out to be zero, right? Because they're balancing out. But is this uh, linear fit perfect? It's not, right? Because uh, it's not really going through all those lines. So if you want to get the actual, you know, something which makes sense, would you take the actual value of the error or some function of the error? What other function could you use? Absolute value. absolute value, exactly. So you could take the absolute value of the error, okay, which we could do. Now you might have come across some other um, error functions. What, uh, so the absolute value, does that have a nice, if you've tried to differentiate it, is it differentiable? Uh, if you take, uh, if, if I say this is absolute value and here's E, what would this equation look like? Well, it looks perhaps something like this, right? Because for negative values, it will also be positive. So again, is the differential well-defined for this? It's not, again, over here, the differential is not well-defined. So absolute error is also not differentiable. Can you think of a function that you could use which is differentiable? Which also doesn't have the problem that, you know, it ends up with uh, all, the, all the values crossing out? The, the square. So square would be nice, right? So what you could do is you could simply take the square of these, and I'll call that as, a, uh, as E hat, 
And now if you think about it, the square is always well-defined. The, the, the differential is always well-defined, right? So if you have any X value and X squared value, it looks something like this, okay? It's well-defined. It's two X is actually the differential. And it also has a nice value that it doesn't cross out, okay? So it has both of these nice values. So we're going to use, we could use other functions as well. For example, could you use X cube, the third value? No, that would also have problems. Could you use the X to the power of four, the error to the power of four? Yes, we could use that, but maybe that's going too extreme. We don't really need to go to that extreme. So we'll just use error squared, okay? Um, for the reasons that I just talked about. So basically now what we're trying to do is we're trying to minimize the square of the error. And, um, and we can use now the gradient descent to be able to minimize the overall error, error. Okay, so now is it all making sense? We can try different values of the weights and we can try to find different values of the biases and we can try to find where does, which value of the weights will actually minimize the error, okay? So, so far we've got a now a plan of action, okay? Let's see how we can actually implement this. So this overall technique is again called back propagation. So this is what something that we uh, looked at. I think this, I showed this to you in lecture seven. Uh, this is the, the overall neural network. It's got a bunch of inputs. And the example that we had earlier was with two inputs, X1, X2, it can have a bunch of different layers. We earlier in the, in the, uh, in the three, uh, in this particular case, we just had two layers, layer one and layer two, okay? So um, now you can actually have a large number of layers over here as well. Uh, you can have some neurons at the output, okay? And you could, in the previous case, we just had one output, but you could theoretically have multiple outputs as well. Okay, and what we're going to do now is we're going to say that we have labeled data because this is supervised learning and we've got a certain output. So this was our Z output. What we're going to do is we're going to calculate the error and actually we're going to calculate the sum of all the errors. So we can say that this is the sum of all the errors squared. Okay, so we could say this could be the sum of all the Z sub I hat minus z sub i to the squared and sum over all of them. And we could take the mean value. So we're summing it over n, we could take the mean value over here, okay? So we would take some function of the overall error, okay? And then use this, this function to be, able to, uh, to be able to use gradient descent to, different, to find out the optimal values of these weights. Okay, so now if you think about the previous equation, in the gradient descent, we had a value of y, which you're trying to minimize, and a value of x, which you're trying to find the optimal value for, right? So in this case, what are the x and y values? The, clearly the y value is going to be the loss, all right, the error, as you call it, okay, that we're trying to minimize. And the x values are going to be the weights, which are unknowns, as well as the biases. So weights plus the biases, that are going to be, we're going to try to determine those. So this is going to be the back propagation. Why is it called back propagation? The reason is that what we're going to do is we're going to go backwards. So you remember the forward equations, those sort of had all the equations going forward, right? And the backward equation, what we're going to do is we're going to find first the optimal, we're going to try to find the better values for these weights and this bias over here. And then we're going to use that to find the bet, uh, the improve the values of the layer before it, okay? And we're going to find the, the derivatives of the loss and so on. And similarly, we're going to keep on going backwards. So that's why it's called back propagation, okay? We're going to go step by step in the negative direction all the way until we find the improved values for each one of the weights right at the beginning, okay? So we're going to work backwards, okay? So now let's see how do we actually go about doing this. So uh, if you think about the gradient descent algorithm, it had X values over here and Y values. And we said that the next value of X is simply the previous value of X minus the, because we're trying to find the minimum value, we're going to take some learning rate R, okay? 
and we're going to take the rate of change of y with respect to x. So this is just a, a reminder. Now, in this case, where we're trying to apply the gradient descent to, um, to a neural network, what should this equation be? So let's say we're trying to, we're trying to um, improve, uh, find an improved value of the weights over here, okay? So the weights could be wi, and we take an initial value. So you're going to try to improve it. So what should be the first parameter over here? W I N, right? So it's going to be the previous iteration. And then what are we going to have? The next value is going to be minus because you're trying to minimize it. And there's going to be some learning rate, okay? And then what should uh, the, the rate of change be over here? The derivative of the 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 derivative of the of the error right and error hat that was the mean square error okay with respect to wi right why because this is what we're trying to we're trying to iteratively improve that okay because here we're trying to iterate, iteratively improve x and we differentiate with respect to x so here we're going to differentiate with respect to w okay so this is going to be our basic equation and if we can use this then you can see that we can now have an iterative method to actually improve the weights, okay? Similarly, we can have an iterative method to improve the biases. What would be the iterative uh, equation for improving the biases? So this was for the weights, sorry, this was for the weights over here. What would be the similar equation for the, for the bias over here? Can somebody tell me what this would be? B n plus one would be an i over here. Y and I. Yes, yeah, so we could have more than once. In this particular case, there's only one bias. So we'll just say B, N plus one minus R, D, what by what? So, so again, we're going to minimize the error, right? Because overall, we're trying to minimize the error, the labels versus the output. So the, it's again going to be the error over here. And what's going to be over here? D. B i right so B over here, so you're going to always differentiate with respect to the parameter that you're trying to minimize, that you're trying to improve. So B uh, sorry n plus one is going to be B n and so on. Okay, well we get that right later. So um, so that's the basic equation, and using this equation, we can actually this is the entire solution. Okay, uh, if now the only technique that is the only question that is left is how do we actually apply it? So let's try to see if we can apply this back uh, um, gradient descent back propagation algorithm to a real neural network. Okay, so um, let's try to solve this. So we have a now we're going to apply it to a single perceptron problem. Okay, and remember what were these? These were the forward equations, right? We already had these, except the only difference here is now that I'm going to use a sigma because the, the activation function is going, has to be sigmoid so that it can be differentiated. We're going to use, um, in the, this case, a simple mean squared error of the error. So uh, the error is simply the labels and the, out, the output are going to be subtracted and we're going to take the square of those two, okay? So, how can we find the rate of change? So we know what this is. We've already done this. W i n plus one is equal to W i n minus R times the rate of change of the loss with respect to W i. Now, W i is all over here and the loss is over here. So can we solve this? How do we find this? Again, a possible calculus reminder. And I've given you a little bit of a hint, the chain rule, right? So the chain rule comes in quite handy. So does anybody remember how we can solve it? Remember now we have E hat in terms of Y, right? What are the, uh, what are the variables which are changing? As X changes, what are the variables that change? So if you think about it, Y will change. Y hat is not really changing, that's a fixed. Okay, so you can differentiate E hat with respect to Y, okay? 
and y is also given in terms of f f f also changes as the inputs change um and we basically want at the end of it with respect to wi so can we find an equation of f with res uh, a rate of change of f with respect to wi yes so you can see that we have all the equations and all we need to do now is use the chain rule okay now somebody has to tell me what the chain rule over here is d e hat by dy very good dy by d w i okay so you've jumped a point now remember uh, y is not given directly in terms of w i is given in terms of an intermediate function which is f so let's use an intermediate function so what would you do df very good df by dw i excellent so does everybody see this and everybody agree with this so this is the simple chain rule and it's being applied in three stages okay so now we can so now let's see if we can do these individually what's the e hat by dy d e hat by dy and I, we can use this over here simple calculus 2 times y hat minus y is that it minus 1 right because you're differentiating with respect to y and this can be simply called as minus 2 e right because this was the original error so far so good okay what so we've done this let's do this uh, dy by D, df what is this rate of change of sigma with respect to f now you already had that earlier right so uh, here it was somewhere over here so this is what this is it so if you if you differentiate sigma with respect to the function it is what so this is simply sigma multiplied by 1 minus sigma okay in complete terms this is actually sigma of f multiplied by 1 minus sigma of f but i'm going to use a shorthand notation just write it like this okay so so far so good we've done this as well let's do the last part df by dwi what is this you going to use this equation over here sum of xi that's it is this right this equation uh there's something wrong with this equation remember you only differentiating with respect to one of those wi's not differentiating with respect to all of them so what's wrong with this you do you need the summation over there think about this so so for example if you try to do df by dw1 and the equation for f is f is equal to uh w1 x1 plus w2 x2 plus the bias right so if you differentiate this with respect to x1 what are you going to get you simply going to get wi you simply going to get xi right you're going to differentiate this sorry with respect to wi w1 so you simply going to get the coefficient of wi which is xi okay so this is there's no summation over here it's simply xi and the b of course is a constant so that drops out so we've done all three of them so finally what should be our solution if i'll write it over here it should be um minus 2e times sigma multiplied by 1 minus sigma multiplied by xi okay so this is this this part right and so we're going to add it over here to this equation and so what is will this equation become w i n and you're going to have a minus r and then this whole thing minus 2 e sigma 1 minus sigma times x i and you can see that minus and minus cross out and you simply left with w i n plus r times 2e times sigma times 1 minus sigma okay 
So this has become very messy. I've got the solution over here. Okay. So WIN plus one becomes WIN. The, there's a plus over here. The two minuses cancel out. Two I error sigma one minus sigma XI. Okay. So um, I hope everybody followed this because this is going to come in the, in the exam at some point. All right. You're going to be asked to, given a particular network, find out the backward equations. All right. This is fairly straightforward, but it's it's quite interesting and intuitive, intuitive as well. Okay. So um, if you've been able to do this, now you should be able to do the next one as well. So how do you how do you find the solution for this is is this going to be simpler or more difficult for us to be able to do this? This should be simpler. Why? Because uh, this is a constant. It doesn't have any weight attached to it. This itself is the weight. Okay. So just looking at it, can you tell me what this was? We've already done this. This is going to be B N minus R and D E hat by D B, right? So this is going to be D B over here. Now, what is this going to be? So this is again going to be very similar to the previous equation. Okay. Uh, it's probably going to have a minus two error sigma minus sigma over here because all of that is coming in over here. The only difference that's going to come in is in this portion. Okay. When you differentiate with respect to WI, you're now going to differentiate with respect to B. So earlier we had XI as the coefficient of WI. Now what's the coefficient of B? It's one, right? So you can think of it as the same equation. The only difference will be that instead of XI, you're going to have one. Okay. So if I solve this, it's, I'll just show you what the solution is. BN plus one is going to be very similar to this. Everything else remains the same here. Everything is the same, except now the coefficient, instead of being XI over here, uh, the coefficient of this is going to be one. So it's sort of like one being multiplied by BI. Okay. Instead of X1 or X2, it's basically the number one is being multiplied by B. Okay. So we've done this as well. So, so, so what you've seen here is a simple application of gradient descent to be able to find an iterative solution to being able to uh, solve the, uh, the single perceptron problem. Uh, and you could solve it for any, for is this only true for the XR problem or could this solve it for any values of, of uh, the, uh, for the labels? It's sort of ge generic, right? Uh, as long as you have the E hats, okay? As long as you have the labels over here, it could be solved for any values, okay? So the next thing that you should be curious about is what if we try to apply this and apply it to the XOR problem, can we in fact come out with this solution, right? So we, we had picked a particular solution. We said that um, this particular solution, one, 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 and using zero and minus one and one and minus two, this solves the XOR problem. Now you should be curious enough and say, well, let's try to apply the iterative technique and see in fact, if we get the same solution or we get a different solution, okay? So you're going to do that in one of your homework assignments. The next one, not this one, okay? Perhaps this one, I haven't given that to you yet. So, um, so now we've done the single perceptron problem and we've been able to solve for the weights for the two cases, for the weights W1, W2 and the, uh, the, the bias, okay? The next question is, uh, how do we solve for a more complicated case? And now, um, how should we solve this? So I said that the back propagation goes backwards in time, right? Not backwards in time, but backwards through the network. So if I, if I said that now, how many equations do we have and how many unknowns and how would we solve this? Can you start giving me some ideas? Do we have all the, first of all, do we have all the forward equations for this? You've already solved the forward equations, right? Those simply come out from here. Now it's a little bit more complex. We've already written those before. We've got now two BIs over here. And uh, the G equation, we've already solved this before. We've got a single uh, bias over here. And now uh, the only difference is that now we're going to use the sigmoid in all of the nonlinear activations, okay? 
So tell me, um, which problem should we try to solve first? Should we try to solve one of these over here? Should we try to solve these over here? We should try to solve the ones at the front, right? Because we're going to work backwards. That was the trick in backward back propagation. We go backwards. So we're going to try to solve WI. Uh, notice that I'm not writing WIJ, but I'm writing WI. Okay. So tell me what WI n plus one would be. W clearly it's going to be WI n minus R times D E hat times W D I. This is kind of obvious by now, right? So this is going to be DWI over here. What is this going to be by the chain rule? D E hat times. So help me out over here. Rate of change of the loss with respect to what? There are lots of variables here. Z, sigma, G, W. So it's going to be with respect to Z. Sorry? With respect to G, you're saying? Uh, remember what we did earlier. We used the output. Okay. So what do we what's the output over here? It's going to be Z. So we're going to do it with respect to Z. This is the final output. Okay. So the labels have to be compared with the actual output that you're getting through the network. That is going to be, it's, it's not going to be accurate. So we're going to look at the difference between those two, and we're going to look at the sum of the differences, the square of the differences. So D E hat with respect to D Z, and then keep going with respect to the, the chain rule. D Z by D G. Okay, good. And then D G by D W I, right. So, uh, so far, so good. I hope everybody's followed that. Okay. And can we solve for this? This is almost identical to the previous one. So can just, can you just looking at this, can you tell me what it was? Um, remember the earlier case was this minus two E Sigma times one minus Sigma times X I. So what is it going to be minus two error? times there's going to be a sigma times one minus sigma over here as well. And what should replace X I? Y? Y? I, right? Because we, we're doing it with respect to W I. So if you're doing it with respect to W one is going to be Y one. If you're trying to figure out W two, it's going to be Y two. Okay. So, so we've solved the first part. Now it's going to be a little bit more tricky because, and then of course, once you've done this, you can also solve for C and C you're basically going to replace Y, y I with a, with one. Okay. Now we're going to try to do one more. Let's try to do W12. Okay. So how, so this is WI, we've already done this. Now let's try to do this. Okay. And we're going to do WIJ. So again, we're going to solve this. So what's the first part? W I J N minus R T E hat by W I J. So this is W I J over here. And using the chain rule, what is it going to be? This is a little bit more tricky. So where do we start with? D E hat by D Z. Very good. DZ by DG, DG by, uh, so this is a bit complicated. So what should we differentiate G with respect to? Y, very good. So it's going to be Y, J, you said, good. So is that is everybody clear? It's going to be Y J and not as opposed to Y I, Y Y J. So think of this case. We're trying to find out the iterative improvement in W 12 right? So W 12 is going through this path and it's going through this path, right? So we're going to differentiate with respect to Y one or Y two. Y two and Y two. The two over here corresponds to J. Okay, so it's going to be dyj. Very good. So keep going. dyj by d what? dfj. dfj, right? 
Why? Because now we're over here. So we're differentiating with respect to this. And then what's the final thing? Dfj by dwij. Okay, good. So you've done it. So you can see how the chain rule is simply being applied and it's going backwards. Okay, seems kind of almost obvious now. Uh, so now let's see if we can solve this completely. So this, the first part is going to be what? This part is going to be what? This, as you can remember, is minus 2e. Okay, dz by dg is going to be what? Sigma times 1 minus sigma. All right. Uh, and then dg by dy j is going to be what? Sorry? W? W what? W? Wj, right? Because we're differentiating with respect to yj. So if you're doing this respect to y2, then clearly it's going to be this, this parameter over here. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, yes, sorry. So this is a mistake over here. Very good. That's going to be i over here, right? So w i y i, right? The i's and j's are independent over here. It's just some variable over here. So this is g is w i times y i. Good. Thanks for pointing it out. And but this just make sure this is correct. This is w j i times x j plus b i. Is this correct or not? We're saying f i, okay? So let's say f two is b two, okay? So this this parameter here is correct, and is going to multiply uh, with res with respect to let's say x one is going to have j this these two are going to be the same, okay? And i over here is going to correspond to this, right? So f two is going to be w12 multiplied by w1 plus w22 multiplied by x2 okay so just double check that so um i hope everybody's agreed that this parameter over here dg by dyj dg by dyj over here is going to be with respect to okay so they can um don't get confused with temporary variables. This is a lot of like a temporary inside a function using a temporary variable. All right. So here, this i, I could replace this with a j. Right. This is just being used in this summation. So here, you're going to actually use the, this is now a, globe, a variable which is coming out from over here. Okay. So over here, i and j are going to correspond to, you, you, can't, you can't use i over here because i corresponds to this i. So you're going to use J over here. Okay, just think that through. You're all computer scientists, not BBS students. So I don't have to explain to you this to you too well. All right, so you can just think of it as, as a function call in which this is here as a, is a temporary variable being used inside a function, okay? So convince yourself that you're going to have WJ over here and not WI, okay? So now that we have WJ over here, uh, what about this dyj with respect to dfj? So we're going to differentiate uh, yj over here with respect to uh, df. Okay, so what is that going to be? Remember, y is simply a sigmoid function of f. So what is this going to be? It's again be sigma times 1 minus sigma. Okay, right? Um, and finally, over here, what are we going to have? Dfi by dwij. So we're going to differentiate this. What are you left with? X, xj. Or is it going to be xi? It's going to be xi, right? Why? Because we're doing wij. So think about this example, w12. So the one is, uh, it's got, the i is going to correspond to uh, is going to correspond over here. Okay, so it's going to be xi over here. So, sorry? Yeah, so in the f equation, uh, you so again, you're differentiating dfi with respect to wij. So here, the, 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 let's see if this is right in terms of xi. 
Uh, that's a good question. Why is it? Okay, so the, where's the mistake? The mistake, mistake is not up here, the mistake is here. This is supposed to be J. Okay, why? Because this was DFJ. So DFJ is going to come in over here. And now you're differentiating FJ with respect to WIJ. So this, uh, so clearly it's going to be XI over here. Okay, so just make sure you convince yourself that it's going to be XI. Okay. So the value parameter is a little tricky and make sure you understand that. Do some experiments uh, on your own. Make sure that you understand this. Okay, this is a little important. So basically, um, this is the answer. If you have a sort of a, you know, this is a two layered neural network. Okay. And this is telling you that you can find out improved values of initially of WI over here. So I'm going to write both of these. You can find out the improved values of these parameters over here initially, and then you can go backwards and you can get improved parameters for these values. Okay. So similarly, you can solve for B, I, and C. I didn't solve those because those were simpler as well. Okay. I haven't shown these actual equations over here, but now you can see that it is not so difficult. You know, it's not rocket science. You can try to do it yourself as well. Um, now there is one, uh, one important point over here that as you solve this, uh, you need to understand that um, some of these values over here, are, are these values over here going to be identical to these values? I've written this as sigma times one minus sigma, but in fact, uh, are these two values going to be the same? Is the sigma over here going to be the same as sigma over here? No, because it's this over here. This is a shorthand notation, but this here is a sigma of F, I believe, right? And this here is a sigma of G. So you will actually have to use the specific values of the sigma at each one of those points, okay? And when you're looking at, for example, a WJ over here, so you're going to actually use the WJ that was used in a previous iteration. So all the previous values are going to come into use as you're going backwards in the back propagation algorithm, okay? And the only way you can actually truly understand this is you actually try to solve it, okay? Now, so one of the problems uh, that I'm going to give you is try to implement this uh, and you can either implement it, you can even implement it in Excel, okay? Or you can try to do it in, in Python or something else, okay? And if you try to implement it, um, it'll make a lot more sense. Uh, G. Sorry? Uh, opposite, Hogya? Okay, so this is going to be, sorry, this is going to be G and this is going to be F. Yeah. Okay. Good. So you're understanding what's going on. That's the important thing. So uh, let's see what the time is. Uh, we've got another five minutes. So now I'd like to give uh, show you something. I don't know if I showed this to you before. So I showed you this before. Now, hopefully it's going to make a little bit more sense. And let's take a quick look at this. So um, this is the, the scenario. Uh, to what extent did I show you this earlier? I think in lecture seven. Uh, we we went through and tried to look at how we can solve the classification problems in different ways, right? So um, here now, hopefully it's going to make a little bit more sense. Now we're using a single perceptron over here, okay? And you can see that thing with a single perceptron and the X values over here, I've chosen these two values. So these are sort of like your dogs and cats, okay? And it's got a bunch of values which you can ch ch uh, change over here. You can regenerate these values and you can restart it. And you can see that slowly, it comes out with an optimal equation over here, which is this linear equation. 